a thought just occurred to me. This is not where you belong on July 16th. You belong where the bomb went off. Back in the day when they cut loose the, the atomic bomb, my mom's family, mom and, and her mother and father were up in that timeline at about five o'clock between 4.30 and five that uh, just getting, getting my grandfather ready to go to work there at the coal mines there in uh, Cartridge, Cartridge and Tokay. And right at the time they cut loose the, the, the bomb, they even heard and seen the light at that time of the morning. They, they seen the light from, from the, the explosion. The, they felt also the shock wave that, uh, that came from that. It was actually in the evening when um, all the gossip started to move around. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. My father was a Navy pilot in World War II. I had uncles that were in World War II. My, one of my uncles, who was just five years older than I am old, uh, went into the Air Force. Um, he became a pilot. And so when I graduated from high school and went to college, I joined the Marine Corps, a, a, a platoon leaders class program. And I went to two boot camps at Quantico to learn to be a Marine. And then when I graduated from college, I was commissioned as a second lieutenant. I went to the Marine Corps Basic School in Quantico. And then after that, I went to guard the base at Guantanamo. And then after that, I was sent to Vietnam for 13 months where we roamed around the DMZ uh, saying, shoot me, shoot me, shoot me, and nobody shot me. So I came back. It, it truly was, it was the first of, I, I really don't remember, of 10, 12 workshops that have been done here in Memphis with Charlie coming to Memphis. Inupi had come back from Magigoria and, sh and she had made friends with Charlie McCarthy and she was bringing him here for his first visit to give a seminar on the theology of Christian nonviolence. There is no more pressing a serious spiritual issue confronting the church, Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestant, 
that whether Jesus taught a teaching, an ethic of nonviolence, or whether Jesus taught a teaching or an ethic of justified violence. She asked me if I would, wanted to come, and I said, no, I don't want to listen to any of that nonsense. I'm a Marine. I'm, going to, I'm probably going to go back to the Gulf War. So I didn't go. And Charlie was just talking, and, and he said he was sharing that we already knew about his 40-day fast for the truth of nonviolence, and I had done that as soon as I learned about it. He had been doing it for a number of years, and that, that there was something missing. And then what he had found in the, in the scripture was that the apostles were having a problem healing people and doing the things that Jesus sent them out to do. And Jesus said, there are some spirits or there are some evils um, that can only be driven out by prayer and fasting. He had gotten the fasting part and in his meditation or thought relative to the prayer, he thought in terms of returning good for evil. And he shared that he was, what he had come to was that the greatest evil in the world that he could geographically locate was the Trinity site. Somehow I didn't equate the, um, the testing of the bomb in terms of that being an act of violence. And that was my first introduction to that concept. Well, I'm getting ready to go to St. Louis to be interviewed in, by this, for this battalion commander job, and Noopy gives me a, cop, a set of McCarthy tapes. So I decided, well, that's great. I'll listen to those tapes for the five-hour drive from Memphis to St. Louis. So I plug them in, and I'm, I'm listening five hours of McCarthy tapes, and by the time I got to St. Louis, I'm going, yep, he's right. He's absolutely right. He's technically right, he's spiritually right. This, he, this is the truth. And as, I, as that revelation dawned on me, I realized that the, the Catholic Church that I had been a part of since birth failed to teach me that. Nobody talked about Christian nonviolence. Nobody talked about these things that Jesus taught. I think what the world should get from the Trinity site is that When that experience, experiment rather, was going on, I don't think people realized the evil that was being unleashed and the consequences of that. And it will go on for generations and generations and generations. It didn't stop with that one day. Or bombing Nagasaki and Hiroshima. That was the beginning. So um, when I came back, um, following that, one of my Marine Corps friends uh, who was, had gone back in the Marine Corps, for some reason his third marriage was breaking up and um, his wife asked him for a divorce one Sunday at dinner, told him she wanted a divorce. He committed suicide. And I decided I was not going to do this anymore. <clears throat> so I stopped participating uh, in the Marine Corps Reserve. And eventually they, uh, they discharged me. <clears throat> One of the consequences was I gave up a retirement. I, I spent 17 years in. I had three more years to go, and, but I decided I didn't, didn't want to be beholden. So um, in the fall of 1990, Charlie had a Another seminar in Memphis at, Saint, at Holy Spirit, and it was the spirituality of nonviolence, where he talked about 
what you have to do to change your mind. And so recalling, I think Charlie made this point clear, Jesus' first words in the Gospels were metanoia. And metanoia is a Koine Greek word meaning change your mind. And so he's saying you have to change your mind. You can intellectually understand the teachings, but unless you change your mind, you can't spiritually put them into practice. So that, that part of the, his seminar impressed me a lot. And um, I went to the desert after that the first time. Charlie said, the word Trinity has no meaning in any language other than the Christian understanding of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, the, tr the, the Trinity. And so Charlie said that he was going there, um, he wasn't inviting anybody, that he was going there to spend 24 hours in prayer on um, July 16th. And the minute he said it, I knew I was going too. In that first trip, there were 12 of us. Most have passed on, but one of them was George Sabelka, Father George Sabelka. And um, what, a, what a gift that was for me to be there with Father Sabelka, because George Sabelka um, was a Catholic priest, a military chaplain to the bomber group that dropped the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. No, I did not protest. My response was the same as to the, the firebombing of, that was going on over Tokyo and other cities. Uh, uh, war is hell, it's terrible, it's uh, horrible, but it's necessary in order to uh, bring uh, peace and bring victory. It was strictly by accident. He, he was brought in in our diocese to give a workshop, a three-day workshop, on the theology of Christian nonviolence. When this entered into my soul, I realized I had to accept everything Jesus tells us, as difficult, as impractical, as far out as it would seem, uh, or else just give it up not just my priesthood, but give up the whole Christian uh, bit. Father George Zabilka stands at the low point when that form of Christianity with, which justifies mass violence and slaughter reaches its nodded at Hiroshima and at Nagasaki with Christians evaporating Christians by the tens of thousands in nine seconds. He's there. He is the channel that communicates the justification for that. We have a problem in Christianity in the sense that history is not just something that occurs in the past. History is what is remembered of the past. And that critical line from Orwell's 1984, he who controls the present controls the past and he who controls the past controls the future because people tend to act in the present and in the future, depending upon how they perceive the past has been. The oldest spiritual tradition in the Christian church is the tradition of nonviolence. It dates from Jesus and goes right from the first martyr Stephen on through the, the conversion from the violent Saul to the nonviolent Paul right on through three centuries, the first three centuries, the centuries closest to Jesus, what we have is a church that is nonviolent. That is, it's not that Christians didn't commit violence. It's that it wasn't approved, as they committed adultery, but it wasn't approved. And there's a world of difference between sin and saying, I'm sorry, getting up and starting over again, and doing evil and calling evil good. And for three centuries, it was absolutely clear that conformity with the mind of Christ, conformity with the heart of Christ, was utterly inconsistent with homicide. The pivotal point, the axial point, is the Emperor Constantine. In 311, you could not be a member of the fighting Roman army and be a Christian. 
By 416, you could not be a member of the fighting Roman army unless you were a Christian. Now, normally, it would be parishioners who would be lighting this, right? He's here. It would not be the priest. So that the the candles, you see, the candles, the parishioners bring them in, and the candles is a, is a symbol, and why it's in the Roman Church too, huh? is a symbol that in order for the candle to give light, to give heat, to do what it's made for, it has to give itself, it has to diminish. So, that, so it gives its life for the, for, for, so others can have life. It gives its light so others can have light. I'd like to speak with, with you at this moment about, about a prayer vigil that goes on every year on July 16th. It takes place just outside the gates of Trinity site in the, in the Mexico desert where the first atomic bomb uh, was exploded on July 16, 1945. Uh, it's been going on uh, since uh, 19, 1990. And every year some people come out and they set up a little tent and a little water and, and they pray for uh, 24 hours huh, on July 16th for um, for forgiveness for what humanity did with the atomic bomb and is continuing to do and for protection from the evil consequences that those choices uh, have brought on humanity and will continue to bring on humanity. At, uh... Well, we come out here, out to this, this desert, gathering people from all different uh, walks of life and, you know, the world, basically. The atomic bomb changed the world back in 19... was it 45? You know, they came out here and, you know, at that time, you know, it was just one little, one little tent and, uh, and, you know, a few drinks and he did the, the rosary on this property um back in whenever whenever he started but uh but basically what we do out here is to to pray for peace pray for the the sick and injured from the the fallout uh here locally and you know uh, also in, in japan a lot of there was a lot of people lost um at that time on both uh uh, on both sites that they had over there in Japan and also here uh, here the fallout from the first the, this one here uh, we're still having the effects of of the, the fallout that's in the dirt and in in the plants that we have it is a long time of of um, of, of uh, sickness and and you know and other stuff that's part of this this what they did it is charlie that started this whole thing and he thought of the idea back then and it it basically this is his baby his child it's one thing to be saying as people say universally Oh, the atomic bomb was a terrible thing. Terrible thing. Uh, it's like saying war is bad, you know? Or, or evil is bad, I'm against it. That, that doesn't, that, that's fine, but it doesn't do much as far as, 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 far as motivating people for the uh, fortitude, for the courage, for the perseverance, for the creativity. To respond with, uh, with with more than with with with, with more than words uh, and, uh, and good intentions. Every year for the last 
39 years as of this year. People have done a 40-day fast from, from July 1st to August 9th. Uh, in order to call the churches of Christianity, call Christianity, uh, back to Jesus' original teaching, the teaching of Jesus in the gospel, of nonviolent love of friends and enemies. I was doing this fast for the 40 days in, in Jerusalem. And on July 16th of that year, I decided to, to go up to, from Jerusalem, up to Galilee, to the monastery of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. So I went up there that day, and we get out of the bus at Haifa, which is the city at the base of Mount Carmel, and we were absolutely positively uh, uh, confused, uh, baffled as to what to do, because all the signs were in Hebrew or in Arabic. And finally this lady came up and, and said, can I help you? Well, we'd like to go up to the monastery of uh, Our Lady of Mount Carmel, and she said, oh, follow me. And sure enough, she knew exactly how to do it and what buses to take and so forth. And we get up there. And lo and behold, it was a little before 10 o'clock, and, and I, I was only going to go there to pray. But what happened was I was just a little before the time that they were beginning their big anniversary mass for July 16th, Our Lady of Mount Carmel. And, and so the Carmelites invited me in to come celebrate, and we did, you know, and we had a, it was a wonderful celebration. They had something good and very, very nice, and a lot of people came, of course. That, that was kind of a very good moment for me in the, in the middle of 16 days into the fast. Huh? And uh, after it was over, and I was just outside after Mass and kind of making a, my, my, my communion, my post-communion uh, prayers, and, and then the thought occurred to me. I mean, it just occurred to me. I was just walking back and forth, no particular prayers I was saying other than my normal ones after communion and of course thinking and the thought just occurred to me um, this is not where you belong on July 16th you belong where the bomb went off the exploding an atomic bomb uh, on July 16th 1945 was a uh, it was a planetary historic day, a humanity special day. I don't know, it kind of hit me with a power, a vigor, a real intensity. That this was what was uh, I was supposed to do. It's the truth. I should be where the bomb went off on July 16th. And so I kind of made up my mind right there, right overlooking the Mediterranean Sea at Our Lady of Mount Carmel, that I was going to do this, and I didn't know where to go or to even think about it. So what took place was that a friend of mine was out, John Carmody, was out visiting his sister Teresa, who lived in New Mexico, and um, I had told him about this idea, and, and he was the one that found Trinity site, and what, where it is and so forth, just emptiness. Huh? It's actually the White Sands testing ground. Huge, huge segment of land set off and guarded and security and everything else. But that's where it was. And uh, so we, we talked about it and we said, yeah, that's, that's where it's, we should be. And let's, let's do it, let's do it. And we, we had no idea, no idea how to go about it. Just that that was, we should be there praying. It's something I've been needing to do for two years. And what happens to us when we get ready to think about coming out here is, in my opinion, Satan sends all these things to interfere with our motivation to come out here. Things that you would never think happen uh, in the days and weeks prior to coming out here. Uh, it's aggravating. You get in fights with people or um, you lose your keys or you know, why am I trying to do this when the weather's so bad out there? It's 110 degrees, and, and all these things keep coming up. And so when I realized that was the deal, I called Noopy on the phone, and I said, Noopy, there's all this, all this stuff happening to keep me from going, and so by golly, I'm going to go.
grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace. My name is Sister Pat McCarthy. I'm a member of the Congregation of Notre Dame, and uh, I have been part of the Trinity Site Vigil uh, from the second year. Uh, the first year I was out of the country at the time of the uh, vigil. And so from the second year on, for the next 19 years, uh, I was a part of it and, you know, involved in the, all of the details that went into the vigil, the writing, the translation of the material into multiple languages, the contacting people, advertising, setting up tents, making the arrangements, and uh, most of all, going there to pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our You were surrounded by the beauty of God and facing the destruction of humanity you know so it was a it's not for the faint of heart all comforts um, are eliminated Um, and the best example of that is in the Gospels, where Jesus goes to the desert. He spends 40 days and 40 nights in the desert. What's there? There's no, nobody's selling him apples. Nobody's providing him bread. It's, he lives on what's there. And why does he do that? Because for all those years, he'd been dealing with the human mind, the mind of his mother and father and friends and the people in Nazareth. and and what they desired, he was, mo he, he, to a certain extent, he had to model those desires in order to participate and get along. And so here it is, he's fulfilling his destiny and he has to rid himself of the human attachments and desires. And how do you do that? You have to go where they're not. You have to go find your place there. July 16th in the atomic bomb was as deep an expression of the history of humanity and its wickedness, as deep as Cain killing Abel. It was a form of Cainism. Human beings killing human beings for their purposes. There's something about the mystery of iniquity in human existence, the mystery of evil. As, as the Mothers and fathers of the church say the mystery of evil is only one speck shot of the mystery of God. There's something bizarre in the fact that when evil thinks it has won, really won, how it gloats, mocks. Think about it. Intrinsic to the passion story of Jesus, his death, here is God incarnate, the Messiah, of Israel, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, who has done nothing to deserve what he's getting, except offend some big shot politicians or big shot religious leaders. And he's being mocked. He's being mocked by just a common Roman soldier. They put a crown of thorns on his head to make him look like a king and mock him and bow down before him and put a purple cloak on, they mock him. 
And they stand in front of them and say, you saved others, now save yourself. Huh? And bow down before him, oh, king of the Jews, you know. Mocking, 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 ridicule. It's evil's way, huh? That after it thinks it's won its victory, it mocks. It mocks. It makes fun of good, which is making fun of God, because it's God who is good. I wonder, I wonder, if that's not the same kind of thing that's taking place at Trinity site when the first atomic bomb is exploded. Here is an instrument that's taking, requiring the best of human intelligence that God has given, going all the way back thousands of years when people first learned how to count and do geometry. All that knowledge, all that knowledge through Newton and Einstein, etc., etc., all that trial and error, all that human life, people that meant good, try to do good, and it's taking it all and it's putting it together in one instrument of massive human destruction. And for the first time that this instrument is, is brought into existence, an instrument that will make the earth in the New Mexico desert as hot as the surface of the sun, that instrument of, of massive death that is introducing massive death into the universe that goes on to this day, that instrument, that place, that time, that event is always known as the Trinity explosion, Trinity site. The word Trinity does not exist before Christianity. Trinity is a Christian word. It refers to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Christian God. One God, three persons. Hmm? Trinity is a requirement of the Christian theology. Not just because at the end of the gospel, Jesus says to the apostles, go ye baptize, make disciples all nations in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Not just because of that, but because Jesus says God is love. Love, agape, unconditional, everlasting love of each and all. He extends the notion of neighbor beyond just the Jewish people to the whole world. Jesus is the father of not just, not just this nation, that nation, Israel. He's the father of all. Our father, your father, my father, his father. That's what the Trinity is about, love. It's all about love. But the love that it's about is agape, unconditional, everlasting love. Not love of Americans, not love of Chinese, not love of uh, Russians, not love of Irish or English. Love of all, all human beings. And we're made, in, and that, Jesus says, is the God we're made in the image and likeness of. We take all that, and we use that, that is all about the God of Christianity, and we give that name to the most destructive event in the history of the world up to that time. I know what Oppenheim has said, that um, he got the name Trinity uh, from a metaphysical poet that, that was talking about the Trinity. That of my heart, three-person God, you know? I'm sure that the Roman soldiers who were mocking Jesus in all those different ways, they didn't care that it was Jesus, the Son of God, Messiah of Israel. They didn't care about that. They were just having fun. They were working out of what they had. But evil, evil was using the moment to mock God, to mock good, to mock the effort at love. But then we think, why shouldn't Oppenheimer have designated that, that unique event in all history? When, when the understanding of the molecular and submolecular reality 
was brought to bear to destroy human beings en masse. Why? The first moment of that. Why shouldn't he name the first moment of that trinity? When for 1,700 years, not 2,000, for 1,700 years, all the churches of Christianity, practically, have been signing themselves with the sign of the cross, one way or another, backwards or frontwards, before they go into battle to kill people. Have been blessed by priests and bishops with the sign of the cross, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for 1,700 years as they went to kill people. I don't doubt what Oppenheimer said some time after the bomb exploded, you know. But what I'm saying is, in the mystery of existence, in the mystery of God, that's way beyond us to understand, in the incomprehensibility of the reality of history, the, the, the macrocosm, the microcosm, and all their dimensions, there is evil, and evil mocks good. Gotcha. Gotcha. And when it gets you, or when it gets a society, or when it gets a person, the feeling is it's an iron claw. There's no escape. This is the way it has to be. We have to continue to put trillions of dollars a year worldwide into making weapons of mass destruction, nuclear weapons, maintaining them, threatening to use them, etc., etc. We have to live as Cain lived. There's no other way. You can't even see another way. As a matter of fact, what we're going to do, we're going to put Cain's way, and we're going to put just Jesus' name on it and call it Christ's way. That's what the churches have done. That's what they do to this second. In Trinity, we have fundamentally a spiritual event. It's a spiritual problem. It's the same spiritual problem that Jesus talks about with the man with the barns. He wants to feel secure. He wants to feel safe from the world, from disease, from death. Huh? Surplus is that. That's what surplus is. It's a way of giving us a sense of feeling safe. And so he so fills his bonds to, to the brim. They're, they're overflowing. And Jesus says, this night your soul will be demanded of you. So it always is. Huh? So it always is. And so what we have here is in Trinity. Trinity site now, I'm talking about the Trinity explosion, nuclear weapons. We have a, a universal diabolical reality. From the tip of the macrocosm down to the lowest level of the microcosm. And jumping over into the spiritual realm the satanic, the diabolical, evil. And it is mocked. And it is mocked. Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Trinity. Trinity Church. The Holy Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Trinity. The mocking. The mocking. Wherever you go around the world, at least in the Western world, not China or India, but in the Western world, the priests and the ministers, Catholic, Orthodox, Protestant, Evangelical, forever saying Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for what is, what, what is only there to be a killing operation. The military. The bombs. And so also the universities and the scientific labs where the men and women go in to Sunday Mass or Sunday worship at their local Catholic or Christian or Bap Protestant, Baptist, or whatever it is, church, Methodist, Anglican. Sing songs to the Holy Trinity, bless themselves, are blessed by the Holy Trinity, and then go back to their work and, and, and developing in the lab on Monday through Friday a, uh, a new instrument, uh, chemical, bacteriological, nuclear, electromagnetic, a new instrument to kill masses of people easily and efficiently. Oppenheimer just spoke out of an intuition, I'm sure. But the intuition, the intuition was far more than, than, than his remembrance of a metaphysical poet. 
The reality is it was evil mocking the God of love as it mocked the God of love with Jesus 2,000 years ago. We go in on the 15th, uh, five or six o'clock, we have a mass. We, we're, most people are up all night doing the rosary. 5.25 in the morning on the 16th, Charlie assembles everybody. We're standing there. Um, there's the altar and there's the, the monstrance with the communion bread and the body of Jesus. And we're looking at Trinity site and he starts the countdown just before 5.30 in the morning. It's 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand, I am tired. Lord, I'm weak, I am, I am worn through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand. You're totally there, and, and you can see it. You can see where it happened, and you can see the, the mountains behind it and as the sun is coming up, and it's like, it's like no other experience. Lead me home when my way grows dreary. Precious Lord, linger near when my... You're there to change your mind. Even though lots of people may not know that, may not realize that, but that's, that's what the, the fast is about, that's what the mass is about, the all-night rosary is about, the getting up in the morning is about. It's not about human pleasure, it's about changing your mind. Lest I fall, take my hand, precious Lord, and lead me home when the day grows dreary. And the night appears, and the day has come and gone, and the river I stand, guide, guide, guide. Guide my feet, Lord, 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 hold my hand. I think um, Father McCarthy probably listened to it and, and you know, realized the uh, impact of that song, you know, that it was more than just words, but it was really calling on the Spirit and recognizing that we really can't do a whole lot without God's hand holding us, leading us to where he wants us to go. And that song basically begs the Lord to do that and to say, wherever you take me, that's where I'm going to go. And when it's all done, I just want to be in your presence. Yeah. The first year that they had this, I didn't come. Um, and then I learned that 
the chaplain for the Enola Gay bomb crew that dropped the bomb on Hiroshima, he came out here in 1990 with Charles McCarthy. And so the next year I came, and I came, uh, this is the 29th year. July 16th, 1945 was the first test of a nuclear bomb. And then the next bombs were used uh, in, on Japan. One of the reasons for coming out here is to pray that it never happens again. And we're asking for divine intervention to, to, to prevent this from happening to, happening to anybody again. My coming out here was, um, was basically a, a prayer. You know, that they say a, a pilgrimage is a, is, a, is a spiritual trip. You physically go and it, and it, the significance to you is much more than if you're just sitting somewhere for a few hours and, and it's, it's uh, two days getting here on my motorcycle and then it's a day or two here. So it's a total devotion of time and mind and money to come here and it changes you. You can't look at things like you used to. Uh, I never, before I came here, I never knew what, what it looked like, what it smelled like, you know, the, what the sand tasted like. <laughs> it's like you're, you're part of it when you come here. So we come to pray here, to pray that it's out of control. I mean, certainly you know and I know as we think about this, it's not going to be stopped by politicians. It, it's, it's, it, we need God's help. We need God's help. And so we pray for God's help with, with Mary. But there's also a need for repentance. It seems like it seems like the way the world we live in now and will live in, and our children and grandchildren will live in, uh, is a world where we're preparing ever, ever more sophisticated ways, chemical, bacteriological, atomic, electromagnetic, of slaughtering people is going to be the order of the day by governments, all government, not, not, not just our the world of science. Big money will go into it. And, uh, and so we will continue the Cainism, the Cainism. Being a priest, being a Catholic priest, I'm, I'm particularly interested in our Christian community, our Christian family, the baptized, you know, baptized in the Christ. Catholics, Orthodox, Protestants, Baptists, Methodists, what have you. And, and of course, Jesus just doesn't reject nuclear homicide. Jesus rejects all homicide, all homicide. And therefore, what takes place is that we gotta be kind of careful in thinking about Let's put a limit on nuclear weapons because putting a limit on nuclear weapons isn't putting a limit on the spirit of Cain. It's just putting a limit on nuclear weapons till someone decides that they're going to go beyond that limit because they got the power to do it. It's the spirit of Cain that's important. And therefore, how to repent of that spirit? You know, back in 1991, uh, we opened... Uh, our statement of purpose, which is still the statement today. We opened with, with two biblical quotes, but one of them was from John, or the uh, epistle of John. For this is the message you have received from the beginning. You should love one another. Unlike Cain, who belonged to the evil one, and slaughtered his brother. Christ, certainly Christians have no business, no, Christians have no business, absolutely, not just with nuclear, any violence, but, but 
my guess is, and it's just an anecdotal conjecture, that, um, that uh, the vast majority of Christians are quite glad that the United States has a nuclear weapon or Russian Christians, that Russia has the nuclear weapon or whatever the case may be, because it will allow them to be like Cain, to kill. Now, you know, the, the whole notion of returning good for evil, and, and believe me, not everybody that goes to the desert has the, the understanding that I'm telling you about. Um, I, I know that Charlie does, and there have been some people that were there. George Sabelka understood what it is. But this whole concept of the way of, of, the way of diminishing evil, the way of transforming evil into good, is the heart and soul that has been lost over 2,000 years, in my belief, of the message of Christ. The issue for the church today is not nuclear war, but the total and unequivocal rejection in theory and in practice of all war and all mass slaughter. There is nothing in the life or teaching of Jesus that would suggest that while it is illegitimate to incinerate people by nuclear warhead, it is legitimate to incinerate people by napalm or flamethrower. Condemning nuclear war exclusively, a Christian can thereby give implied moral approval to other forms of mass slaughter. What level of slaughter is acceptable? When I return your violence with my violence, any possibility of your recognizing it and being transformed, transformed being another word for converted, you know, if we're going to put it in religious terms, turned away from the, the road you're on, the only possibility for that is if you are made to see clearly that it was not necessary, that, that it was harmful and unnecessary. And the only way you're going to be able to see that is if I am able, through the grace of God and the teachings of Jesus Christ and the witness of the few that have understood it and tried to put it into practice, that if I am able to meet your violence with love, something that is that sounds weak and passive and pusillanimous and every kind of word that you want to think about that means weakness or being a doormat. But if I have the strength and the grace to meet that evil with love, then there is the possibility for a change of heart. From Isaiah. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. My thoughts higher than your thoughts. But the danger is that we think God can do no more than we can do in the human situation. Because we can't see a way out, God has no way out. Because we can't see a way out by our own will and so forth, if we cooperate with the will of God, there's still no way out. And that's not so. That's just a lie. God doesn't impose. But if, if in our freedom we want to cooperate with the will of God, if our free will wants to cooperate with the will of God, there's ways out that are unimaginable. There are ways out that are more majestic and wonderful than the Red Sea parting for Moses. Look at the mocking in Jerusalem of Jesus on that day 2,000 years ago. The death, the hopelessness, the, 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 everything, as low as you can go. Shame, pain. Oh, there's a way out. Three days later, Jesus rose from the dead. The resurrection. If Good Friday was the end of the story of Jesus, we wouldn't be here today. But Good Friday is not the end of the story. Easter Sunday is. God had a way. 
And then, yeah, evil had its day. Get yourself down from the cross. You, you saved others, save yourself. Hmm? Boy, king of the Jews bowing before him. Crown with the crown of thorns. There's, there's, your, there's your crown for your king. Here, throw a purple robe over him. Ha ha. Resurrection. Resurrection. There is a way out of everything the Trinity site represents. And Trinity site represents everything from Cain to today. Today's normal. Today's normal. Perhaps more money in the world is spent on figuring out how to kill people and killing people than on any other project. It's normalized. You go to Christian university, Catholic university, they'll train you how to kill an ROTC. They'll train you. You get tuition cuts, a tuition paid to learn how to kill. And they'll be glad to get the money and glad to help out with the government and get more money. No, 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 no. That's evil. That's evil. That's, that's just not a political thing to, to, to stay in good, in good graces of the government. No, that's evil. It's teaching people under the auspices of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Father, Jesus, and the Holy, and the Holy Spirit. Not any spirit. The Holy Spirit, which is the Spirit of Jesus, it's teaching them how to kill. That's what Trinity Site is. And that's the normal in which we live. But God's ways are higher than our ways. God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And if we will unify our will with the will of God, and how do we know the will of God? Because God became flesh and showed it to us in Jesus, by word and deed. And when Jesus gives the only commandment he gives in the New Testament, love one another as I have loved you, he calls it his new commandment. That is the way to unify our will with God's will, by loving as Jesus loved which is the love that is, from eternity to eternity, God. And that love has the power and wisdom of God in it. That love is all-powerful. That love saves. From all the Trinity site represents, universally, from Cain till today, that love is the love that is salvific for humanity. Now the church can teach that, Christians can follow that, the world can believe that Jesus knows what he's talking about or not. But God came and told us how to conquer evil. It's the definitive revelation and there's no other way of doing it. And so, and so, Trinity Site is more than a moment. Trinity Site is the universal dilemma of human beings from Cain till today. It's a universal dilemma that marks a signpost in time when some terrible event ended, but it was the same spirit at Trinity Site that lived in Cain and that lives in everything we're doing today that is preparing for, executing, paying for, killing love in other human beings. As you can see by the shape of our tents, we have no money and um, the wind out here gets ferocious. So our tents, the bugs are bad this year. Our tents are, uh, have survived more or less uh, some more, a few years longer than others. And um, so we've just, you know, managed to scrape together a little bit of money just to get these pathetic little tents uh, to protect us from the sun and sometimes the rain at night, but it gets very windy here. So um, we just come out and we spend the 24 hours in prayer and uh, in the presence of the Blessed Sacrament and we're Catholics. Now, not everyone that comes is Catholics, everyone is welcome, but the prayer is out of our tradition. And so we have 
a mass at the beginning on the 15th, and then we stay all night in prayer and in vigil, and uh, we pray in the rosary once an hour. I really do believe that peace is possible. I don't think it's only for the idealistic people who are too naive to realize that the world doesn't work that way. Um, I have been in war. I was bombed. People died all around me in Bosnia and Herzegovina. To waste all of that time and talent and money on a weapon that would do nothing but destroy people and destroy countless of pe people in just the production and the testing. More Americans have died from nuclear weapons than died in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The statistics are all there. You get them from the, um, our government itself. We want to blame it on others, but we are the ones that have initiated this level of weapons. We're not the ones that initiated every act of violence in the world, but this level of, vi of the weaponry we certainly have done that. And so we are responsible for counteracting against it. And that's what we're here for. We don't judge. We don't think we're morally superior to everyone else. We're here simply because we believe that we have to make a stand against these weapons of mass destruction that are definitely here. <laughs> and. Um, and, and they're here with our taxpayers' money, and they're here at the expense of all other programs. And beyond the programs, they're here at the expense of the very moral fiber of who we are. And so we come every year for this reason. This is going to sound strange. I was always happy when a lot of people came, but I've learned early in my life never to go by numbers. So if one person is there, uh, then that's the person that's praying for peace. And the Holy Spirit is there, so the Holy Spirit doesn't count numbers. And uh, so we don't go by that uh, for, uh, for efficacy. It is the work of God. And so we do the best we can and trust that, uh, and believe, not just trust, we believe that, that God is using this place, this time, this way. There's something that takes place in the gospel that can probably be best explained with the words, word rather, that has been used, I guess, since the 18th century, that's, that's called transvaluation. The value of something in the human eye can be transvalued, can be changed into something else completely. So for example, if you, on, to, to, just, to just look, to just read history of what a crucifixion was, I don't care if you're a Christian or a Hindu or a Jew or, a, or, or an atheist, just to read what's done to a person by crucifixion. You would, you would say, this is, this is wrong, this is, this, no, no, I don't know. Even if you've got to kill the guy, this is not it. This is a brutal death. No, no, this is evil. That's, the value of the crucifixion was, it was evil, just evil. But think today, think today what's said in all the churches of Christianity, all the churches of Christianity. We are saved by the cross of Christ cross is crucifixion. We are saved by it. Not by the animal pain of Jesus, not by the, 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 the scourging and the lance and the, and the suffocation, humiliation. Saved by the cross of Christ. The cross, is a, the, the cross is not a symbol just of physical pain. It's the way Jesus went through the cross. Loving his enemies, doing good to those who hated him. Living the will of God, the will of love, divine love. And indeed the cross saves us. And indeed the cross is the symbol of how we're supposed to live. Jesus says, pick up your cross daily, which means pick up responding to evil with love, Christ-like love daily, momentarily, moment to moment. That's the cross. Now we've, we've made the cross into just raw physical pain. Raw physical pain is the cross. 
Raw physical pain is the universal in, human, in the human situation. That's all over the place. How Jesus responds is absolutely, positively at, at the heart of what the cross means in Christianity. And to leave that out of it is to just not consider the whole story that's there in the Gospels, the whole history of it. And to make it into one dimensional, animal pain saves. God wants animal pain. God wants love, not pain. God wants love, not pain. And the cross, now, if we accept the cross, and it is a cross to love the guy that cuts you off in the, in the grocery store line, like he's a big shot and just walks in ahead of you to say, to, 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 to love him. We all know how difficult it, that is to love as Christ loved, unconditionally, because he's a brother, a sister, she's a sister, a, a, a child of God, like you are and I am. Yes, yes, the cross has been transvalued. And so Trinity sight, Trinity sight can be transvalued, can be transvalued if human beings want to do what is required to transvalue it. For example, I forget who Augustine or someone else said, there's no holier place on the face of the earth than where enemies are reconciled. Trinity site could become a place of reconciliation. Recon real reconciliation. Not just, okay, I won't do that again, but, but really, I'm sorry for doing this, and, and beyond that, let's work together. Let's, let's do things together for each other and for other people. Yeah, that's, that's, there's the God of love, huh? There's the reconciliation Jesus came to bring. There's a new destiny for humanity. If you want peace, you have to be peace. And the way to do that is not by building weapons and glorying and basking about the fact that, you know, you have these weapons and this is how you're going to control other people or other uh, communities or other parts of the world. And, and I want that part, not only for me, that part about peace and love and understanding and forgiveness for myself, but I also want to be that instrument to bring that to others because that's where the joy in life is. That spirit that lives in us, that we awaken when we say yes to that spirit and and then be that presence to others. To me, that's joy. And that's being, that's being a disciple. God is Father. God is love. And we are to be icons of that, images of that, agents of that. That's why we're given the gift of faith, to be channels of that whoever we come in contact with as long as we got a few years and a few moments left. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna go that way. Do you know how much that weighs? No. Want me to carry it? No, no. Some days it weighs a ton. And then some days, it weighs nothing. <laughs> it just depends on the moment. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand, I am tired, Lord, I'm weak. I am, I am one through the storm, through the night. Lead me on to the light 
take my hand, precious Lord, and lead me home when my way grows drift, precious Lord, linger near, when my time has come and gone, hear my cry, hear my call, hold Lest I fall, take my hand, precious Lord, and lead.